Good morning and welcome to the 36th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones? As meeting papers are provided in digit format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. Today we have received apologies from Alec Rowley. This is the first, first, fourth day of Stage 1 evidence in the Fuel Poverty Bill and our final evidence session before we consider our report to Parliament on the Bill in the new year. And I welcome today Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, Amanda Callaghan, Head of Tackling Fuel Poverty Unit, and Ailey Clarkson, Statistician, Scottish Government. I also welcome Jackie Bailey and Liam MacArthur to the committee meeting who are in attendance for this item. I invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, as you know, the Fuel Poverty Bill has three key aims. Uh, these are to set a target that by 2040, no more than 5% of Scottish households are in fuel poverty, uh, to create a new definition which better aligns fuel poverty uh, with relative income poverty, and to produce a, a long-term fuel poverty strategy. Uh, Scotland is one of only a handful of European countries uh, to define fuel poverty, uh, let alone set a goal to eradicate it. Uh, achieving the target will place Scotland amongst the very best in the world in terms of tackling fuel poverty. So let me say a, a few words on each of these three aims ahead of questions. Uh, and the target, uh, there's no doubt in my mind uh, that our target is challenging but achievable and, importantly, deliverable. Uh, of the four key drivers of fuel poverty, uh, two are out with our direct control. Uh, these are fuel prices and income. Uh, therefore, we are concentrating on two, two of the drivers we can change, poor energy efficiency and how energy is used in the home. Uh, we must bear in mind uh, that most Scottish homes are owner-occupier, uh, and bringing these households out of fuel poverty uh, will involve a level of intervention in their private homes which is unprecedented and relies on technology being affordable and in line with low-carbon technologies. Uh, to bring forward the target date, uh, risks a uh, rise in fuel poverty due to higher installation or operating costs for households. The 2040 target gives us time to bring the public with us uh, and aligns with Energy Efficient Scotland's target of all fewer poor, ha poor households reaching EPC Band B by 2040, if technically feasible, cost-effective and affordable. Uh, we want Scotland to continue as a world leader in tackling fuel poverty, so it is important uh, that we create jobs and opportunities uh, for new workforce skill sets and to allow local supply chains to evolve to deliver low-cost, low-carbon heating solutions within their own local communities to ensure that local economies feel the benefit. Uh, I want to make clear, though, that I expect considerable progress to have been made in our fight against fuel poverty well ahead of the 2040 target date. Our draft fuel poverty strategy, uh, published alongside the bill, contains important interim milestones. The first of these is that by 2030, uh, the overall fuel poverty rate will be less than 15%, and the second is that median the median fuel poverty gap based on 2015 prices before adding inflation will be no more than £350. I'd like to inform the committee that I intend to bring forward amendments at stage two uh, that will enshrine these two ambitious interim targets into legislation. Uh, let me now turn to our definition. Uh, by bringing the def definition of fuel poverty closer uh, to the definition of relative income poverty, we aim to achieve a fairer Scotland. We are determined to put right the situation whereby under the current definition, some ho households with low incomes do not qualify as fuel poor. Uh, I hope you had a chance to read over the briefing that I sent in advance of today's session which highlights that 76,000 more income poor households would be considered fuel poor than under the current definition in 2016. 
As you know, convener, we intend to use the minimum income standard produced by the Centre for Research and Social Policy at Loughborough University. Uh, this will be set at 90% of this standard after the cost for fuel, housing, council tax, water rates and childcare are deducted. Uh, we want the new definition of fuel poverty to work for everyone, uh, no matter where they live uh, in Scotland. Uh, we have listened to calls that the measurement of fuel poverty should include an uplift in the minimum income standard for remote rural areas. In his oral evidence, Alistair Calder of Argyll and Butte Council um, suggested increasing the minimum income standard threshold to over 100% in these areas. Ahead of stage two, uh, I can confirm to the committee that I will look at this suggestion seriously and consider how best such an up uplift can be achieved for remote rural areas. Finally, uh, on our draft strategy, uh, I want to emphasise that we are determined to continue to work with partners and stakeholders across Scotland to ensure that the final strategy addresses all drivers of fuel poverty. I've had many discussions uh, on the strategy and I know that what people want is a focus on delivery and ensuring that no one has to live in a cold, damp home. Um, convener, I look forward to answering your questions. OK, thank you very much for that, Minister. Can I just start off with a couple of questions? Uh, given the government failed to meet the 2016 target, uh, do you think that it would be appropriate for penalties of any kind to be put in place to ensure that targets, minimum targets, uh, interim targets and the uh, final target were in place for the government to...? Um, Clearly, the huge rise in energy costs in the decade after the target was set in 2002 uh, was a major factor uh, in not meeting that target. target. Um, and when you consider um, that scenario, um, where fuel prices um, rose dramatically during the course of that, I don't think it could have been reasonably foreseen when that target was announced uh, that we wouldn't meet it. Um, and I do think that it would have been unfair um, to, to, to have penalties in that regard. If fuel prices had risen um, in, in line with inflation at, at that point, um, what we would have seen uh, under the current definition uh, would have been uh, fuel poverty figures of 8.5% rather than 24.9%. Um, so penalties for failure to meet the target. I don't believe that if penalties had been in place in respect of the 2016 target, it would have been met. Um, we don't know which government will be in power in 2040. Um, and I don't see it as, uh, I don't consider it to be appropriate um, to set out consequences in the bill for a future administration's failure to meet the target. Um, clearly, the uh, consequences of not doing so um, are um, obviously political and, and reputational. What I would hope, though, um, convener, uh, with what we have set out in the bill in terms of five yearly reporting, is that this government and future governments uh, will be scrutinised uh, by this committee and its successors and by the parliament as a whole uh, to see uh, if we are on track. Thank you for that. The, the, there's been a lot of talk about shortening the period, and you mentioned that in your opening comments, your opening statement to 2030-2032. Could you maybe expand a wee bit on the reasons why you think 2040 is the optimum time? Um, convener, the Scottish Government uh, wants to set a target uh, which was both realistic and uh, achievable. Um, and we believe that in setting a, a target for 2000, uh, 2040, with no more than 5% of households uh, being in fuel poverty at that time, meets uh, that uh, achievability uh, and realistic target setting. Um, the 2040 um, uh, uh, target aligns with the EPC targets that are contained in Energy Efficiency Scotland route map. Um, it lends itself to the achievement 
of the interim target of the climate change bill um, that by 2040 Scotland's net emissions uh, must be at least 78% lower uh, than the baseline. Uh, bringing the target forward uh, to a much earlier year uh, would mean utilising technologies uh, to uh, reduce fuel poverty, uh, which rely on existing high carbon heating fuels. Uh, and this would, uh, in some cases, lead to households uh, maybe needing two interventions um, in the time period in order to meet climate change objectives uh, as well as everything else. One of the other key things for me, um, convener, and I, I briefly touched upon it in the opening remarks, is ensuring um, that we get the ultimate amount of benefit as a, as a country um, from this, um, this programme. Um, I have spoken to some members uh, around the table about various aspects of delivery previously, and I'm sorry if I'm going to, to bore um, some people by repeating myself. Um, for example, um, in Orkney, um, when I uh, was first appointed to this role, um, it was suggested that I uh, take away uh, some of the, more, the, the monies that Orkney had had uh, in terms of the Heaps Ab scheme because it had not been uh, used. Now, looking at that, you could see uh, the reasons why uh, that hadn't been done, uh, uh, because there was not the uh, pipeline uh, of work there uh, initially to get the skill set up uh, to allow folk to get on with the job there. Now, I think that in setting this target, we have a, a situation where we can set in place a pipeline uh, to allow um, companies to boost the skill sets that are required in various parts of Scotland, rural and urban, so that they too can benefit in terms of employability um, uh, in uh, delivering uh, on uh, the schemes that, that we have in place. So I think uh, 2040, as I say, is realistic. It is ambitious, but we can do so. Um, and as I outlined in my opening uh, remarks, I'm willing to put interim targets into legislation uh, to ensure that we continue to move forward. Can I just, on that point, are you suggesting then that if this was brought in earlier, it would be the existing larger companies that would benefit from it as opposed to local I, workforces? I, I think it, uh, it is likely that um, uh, larger companies who could tool up quicker would benefit. <coughs> Um, beyond that, um, I do think that we would uh, have missed opportunities in terms of allowing small and medium-sized enterprises um, to, to actually um, carry on this work. But I think one of the key things is that in some regards, if you bring this forward, um, we may have to have um, two sets of interventions in folks' houses. Um, uh, a, an intervention may be using existing technology, um, which we would have to... Uh, get rid of at a certain point uh, to replace with uh, more carbon uh, efficient uh, technologies in the future. So I think there's a logicality to this. It is realistic, it is ambitious, but it is deliverable. Okay, thank you. And just on the, 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 my last question is around the 5% target. Why are you setting a 5% as opposed to a zero target, which would leave, what, potentially 140,000 households and and fuel poverty by 2040? Um, convener, the, the government is absolutely committed to tackling fuel poverty um, wherever it exists in Scotland. Um, we have a long-term ambition to eradicate fuel poverty and we will keep working uh, towards that. Um, at the same time, it is important to recognise um, uh, w without uh, doubt um, that there will be households um, who will move in and out of fuel poverty. I come back to the point that while we can deal um, with certain aspects of this in terms of the energy efficiency programme and changing people's behaviours, uh, we have no control over people's incomes or over fuel prices. Um, so there will always be a, a small uh, amount of people who will move in and out of fuel po poverty uh, due to a change in their income or a, a change in the cost of energy. Um, it is also important to note that the um, target is for no more um, than 5% of households to be in fuel poverty in 2040. So if we manage to get the level down 
uh, to five percent. We're not just going to say um, that that's job done uh, and stop trying, um, because our ambition um, is to ensure um, that as many folk of, as possible uh, are out of uh, fuel poverty. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Kenny Gibson, then Andy Whiteman. Once yeah, again. Thanks uh, very much, convener. I was heartened uh, in your opening statement that um, we're talking about rural uh, and island communities. You're talking about the minimum income standard possibly being raised to 100% or even 110%. But I think uh, what's really important from the evidence we've received so far is not just the extent of the problem, but clarity on how we, uh, how we define and address those communities. So, for example, under current... Um, remote rural definition, um, Kirkwall, Lerwick, Rothsey and Stornoway wouldn't actually meet it because the population is more than 3,000. On our island communities, and I'm sure you'll agree that uh, in the islands there's a real issue, Orkney, as you know, and I'm sure Liam will go into this in some detail, 59% of people in fuel poverty is the highest in, in, in Scotland. So I'm just wondering how um, the minimum income standard can be uh, in how the, how the definition, sorry, can be incorporated, can be can be amended to ensure that all people on Scotland's islands um, effectively are covered by this, and how you can hone down remote rural um, on the mainland as well. Um, convener, as I said in my opening remarks, I um, intend to ask my officials uh, to look very closely at all aspects uh, of this. Um, Mr Gibson, um, who of course represents Islands himself in the form of Aaron and the Cumbries, um, uh, knows uh, full well um, some of the aspects of island life. Um, uh, we will look at that. We will look at the situation uh, whereby, um, Mr uh, Gibson is right, um, Orkney, let's take Orkney as the example, um, would be... Uh, uh, classified as remote rural, Kirkwall at this moment would be classified as a, a, a remote town um, and not as remote rural. Um, as we um, go through this work, we will look um, at those situations um, to see uh, what uh, we can do uh, in that regard. Uh, beyond that, in terms of the islands um, themselves, um, we are all very aware of the Islands Bill um, and uh, many parts of that have not yet come into force. The, uh, many parts of the Islands Act, should I say, have not yet come into force. Um, but I have uh, said that we will carry out um, an Islands Impact Assessment uh, on all aspects of this bill um, before um, Stage 3. Thanks. In fact, that was the very last sentence in your briefing, which you supplied the committee with, so I've got that actually sitting in front of me. Um, one of the things that I was asking about last week when, in terms of some of the local authority representatives was um, how we're going to tackle this um, across Scotland at a local level. We've got 32 local authorities, but the disparity in fuel poverty varies between 20% and the 59% we've already mentioned in Orkney. <laughs> And clearly, when you're when you're looking, when the government's looking to reduce fuel poverty, you look for early wins, and you might and, and low hanging fruit might be addressed. But clearly, there's there's going to be issues of people who have much more deep seated fuel poverty. W one way of of, of tackling that uh, 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 um, would be to give each local authority specific targets, so that you're not just looking at a national target. You're giving each local authority specific targets. Is that something the Scottish government will be looking to to do to try and Ensure that all areas of Scotland are kind of, you know, the, the, um, you know, uh, um, address fuel poverty in a kind of equal kind of way. Um, Convener, uh, I have continued throughout this to have discussions with um, local authorities, uh, the length and breadth of the country, and um, with um, COSLA. Um, that's not something. Um, that uh, has uh, come on the agenda, but it's something um, that uh, you know I am willing uh, to consider um, in cooperation um, with uh, local authorities. Uh, Mr. Gibson uh, mentioned low-hanging fruit there, and I think in terms of many local authorities, uh, we have seen. Um, with the uh, utilisation of the resources that have been put in place for the Heaps Ab schemes, uh, the Heaps Area Base schemes, uh, we have seen uh, a lot of low-hanging fruit already being grasped. 
uh, I do recognise um, without doubt um, that they need to look much closely, m m much more closely, at how to deal with some of the more problematic um, areas. And many local authorities, to their credit, um, are already doing so um, with some very innovative schemes um, across the country. Uh, and to take into account, um, you know, the difficulties that exist um, in certain places. Um, uh, you know, we have ensured uh, as a government uh, that the allocation of resource reflects uh, the needs uh, of, uh, of various places. For example, um, our island uh, communities um, benefit, uh, our island councils benefit from uh, three times more per head of population of spend on heap sabs um, than those in the mainland. Uh, because we do recognise that there is uh, there are differences there. Uh, beyond that, in terms of discussions and continued discussions with councils, um, you know, I uh, have allowed, uh, 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 announced just uh, three or four weeks ago, further flexibilities in terms of delivery um, in island communities, um, looking at bringing in uh, new things into schemes like microgeneration, the removal of asbestos, um, and the installation of oil tanks. So we will look at that fle those flexibilities and continue to do so. Um, and I will consider um, having further discussions with local authorities around about setting um, individual targets if that is deemed to be appropriate. And in those targets, will you be addressing uh, extreme fuel poverty, where a household is required to spend over 20% of its uh, income on fuel? Because uh, uh, the, the annual Scottish House Condition Survey includes data on that, but it's no mention in the bill or the policy memorandum or the draft fuel poverty strategy. And one would have thought they'd be the people you'd want to focus on first. Um, in uh, our draft strategy, um, we have proposed fuel poverty uh, gap targets for 2030 and 2040. Uh, which considers uh, the depth uh, of fuel poverty. Um, this is uh, effectively a measure uh, of the size of the gap between the household's required fuel bill to stay warm um, and the fuel bill it could just afford if it was to spend 10% of it, its income on fuel costs. Uh, a measure of the gap was something uh, which the independent panel and explored uh, in relation to the proposed new definition, definition and suggested as, a, 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 as means by which the severity of fuel poverty can be better understood. Uh, the approach that we are proposing and all that we're doing is therefore in line with the panel's view uh, and is designed to tackle um, those folks that are in extreme uh, fuel poverty. Just one, last question. just one last question. Thanks very much, Convener. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for your indulgence. Um, en Energy UK, the trade association, association representing energy suppliers, is concerned that, and I quote, the target's ambitious focus on reducing fuel poverty outright will be a challenge. Some factors, such as a regulatory framework around energy prices, for example, do not fall within Scotland's devolved powers. And in power, one of the big six said that... Uh, they're concerned that uh, perhaps the Scottish Government has overlooked some of the lessons learnt from what they call was the poorly designed 2002 to 2016 target. They're saying that targets can be stretching but must be controllable, alluding to the fact that fuel costs and incomes are largely out with the control of the Scottish Government. Um, Convener, I <coughs> uh, think our target is ambitious but deliverable. Um, I do wish that we had control over the other two levers of power in terms of energy prices and income. I think that would um, make life much, much easier in terms of the formulation uh, of this bill um, and also um, in, in terms of delivery. Um, you know, um, while... Uh, we don't control those levers. That's not to say that we are not making efforts to try and change um, some of the things that are going on out there. Uh, colleagues and I have uh, met on a number of occasions uh, with the um, energy providers uh, 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 around about some of the obligations that uh, we feel that they should have. Um, for example, um, I've gone on record on a number of occasions 
um, saying uh, that I find the use of prepayment meters um, uh, uh, in uh, households that are, are most fuel, fuel poor um, to be an awful situation. I wish we had the ability um, to, to deal uh, with that, but we do not have those powers. But that's not to say that we will not continue to um, argue uh, with these companies uh, around uh, about um, uh, these issues. Um, in terms of uh, energy uh, delivery itself, um, the, the Scottish Government uh, will consult in 2019 uh, on uh, proposals for a public energy company for Scotland uh, with the twin objectives that were set out by um, the First Minister uh, to help address fuel poverty uh, and to support economic development. And our consultation will seek the views uh, on the outlined business case that is currently being developed on our behalf. Um, so while we don't have full control, we will always try uh, where we can to bring our other policies into place uh, to try uh, and deal with some of the situations that are currently out with this Parliament's control. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Uh, Andy and then Graham. Very much, uh, convener. Thank you, uh, Minister. Um, I just want to raise this question that um, you said that the Scottish Parliament has no control over people's incomes, um, etc. What we're talking about, of course, in the definition is not people's gross incomes, but their net incomes, and then their incomes after certain costs have been taken out. So would you agree that um, we have substantial control over people's net incomes on the basis that we control how much income tax they pay? Uh, council tax, we control 15% of the benefits system, uh, housing costs, rents, etc. are all substantially under our control. Public sector workers are 20% of the workforce, we uh, control public sector pay. So we have a lot of control over people's net incomes for the purposes of assessing fuel poverty. Um, but there are also a lot of areas that we uh, don't uh, control at all. Um, we don't uh, control, uh, for example, the national minimum wage. And let me give uh, a, an example of, of where, um, you know, if we did have uh, powers, we could uh, make some difference. Um, uni universal credit um, convener, which we do not control, um, has a huge impact um, uh, and uh, is, uh, with the changes that have been brought into play by the UK government, um, there's very little that we can do around about that. Um, Mr Whiteman points out that we will control uh, some aspects um, of the social security system, uh, but 85% um, of uh, the social security system still lies uh, under the control um, of the UK government. Now, while there are some things uh, that we can do, um, and we are doing them, uh, we have, at this moment in time, I have officials looking at housing costs and various other uh, aspects of, of people's um, lives and uh, how that affects their income. Um, uh, but large swathes of this still lie with the UK government. Um, and while we can, at some, in some cases, tinker um, at the edges, sometimes do a little bit more than that, we have to take cognizance uh, that a large amount of this still rests um, with the UK government. I, I don't want to get into debate about how, how large, but given that we control how much income tax people pay and council taxes and housing costs and all the rest of it, and this is a net, a net figure, uh, I think we have more control than um, perhaps you're uh, suggesting we do. Um, I want to move on to the definition itself, which most witnesses have described and I think we would all recognise is a more complex definition um, than the current one. And when we've been out visiting um, uh, local authorities and parts of Scotland looking at fuel poverty, obviously to deliver the strategy, to, to implement measures that are designed to eradicate fuel or to reduce fuel poverty, um, local authorities uh, and others use proxies, council tax bans, um, take up of benefits, etc. In your view, will those proxies have to change substantially, given the new definition, which is, um, gives a more accurate and a more nuanced and more targeted definition of fuel poverty? Or are the current proxies that are used in heap sab schemes, etc., 
uh, still relevant, do you think? Um, convener, the, the new definition, uh, just like the current one, um, is primarily a statistical tool for giving us a nationwide uh, picture of fuel pro poverty. Um, and as Mr Whiteman rightly has pointed out, our fuel poverty schemes uh, generally use various proxies, um, such as uh, receipt of particular benefits, uh, and uh, we uh, don't have any plans to uh, change the use of proxies at present. However, we do intend to review the proxies used, uh, particularly for the eligibility um, of our Warmer Home Scotland scheme uh, to consider whether these could, could be more closely aligned uh, with the proposed new definition. Um, we will uh, continue to look at all of this. Uh, one of the things um, which I am always uh, keen uh, to hear as well is from local authorities um, about um, particular circumstances in their areas where, um, you know, another proxy um, uh, could be used. And I've had discussions with some members uh, around the table uh, around about uh, all of that. Um, I think members will be aware um, that we are also looking um, at a doorstep tool um, to deal with some of this. I know that that's looked upon uh, favourably. Um, by a number of stakeholders, uh, not so favourably uh, by others, uh, but we will continue to work with people uh, in these regards in order to get that right. So, well, th thank you very much. Um, you, you, you circulated a letter to the to the committee um, er earlier this week, and you, in Annex B, you include the example of Anne, um, who is a single parent with a six-year-old child um, at school. Uh, she's currently not in fuel poverty under the existing definition, um, but your workings in Annex B show that under the proposed definition, she would be in fuel poverty. How does, let's say Anne lives in West Lothian, how do West Lothian Council find Anne now that she's in fuel poverty? Um, I'm trying to find uh, Anne here, um, if you bear with me, uh, convener. Um, <laughs> I, I missed that, sorry. Um, uh, in terms of uh, West Lothian Council, um, I uh, am unable to answer how West Lothian uh, Council um, finds Anne. Um, I uh, am unaware um, of the day-to-day -day workings of how West Lothian Council deals this with this. Is, what, I, what I will say, um, in, in, in general... Um, terms in terms of uh, some of the visits that I've had around the country uh, during the course of the discussions uh, of this bill, it would be fair to say um, that some councils would be more adept at finding Anne um, and dealing with Anne's situation um, than others. Um, and what we need to do um, is to make sure uh, that we have in place uh, the uh, the abilities uh, in each place uh, to find the likes of Anne. In some cases, Anne would be easily found um, in areas where there have been area-based schemes taking place, where people um, have been spoken to, where lots of Anne's exist in a particular place. If Anne um, lived in an area um, where um, there is no um, uh, so much uh, poverty, um, then Anne in certain places would be harder to find for a local authority. Now we need to turn that around, we need to turn that around in cooperation, not only with local authorities but with other partners to ensure um, that we uh, reach uh, all of these people. Mr Gibson rightly pointed out earlier on that in some regards, in some places, we already have found uh, all of the low-hanging fruit and help folks um, uh, in, in uh, these areas, particularly through area-based schemes. We need to become a little bit more sophisticated in that um, uh, regard in some places. Some local authorities are further advanced than others in terms of that. So just to conclude, convener, but I would seek your agreement, therefore, that in a more nuanced definition, where people like Anne are coming into the system, it's kind of pointless having a new definition for national statistical purposes. 
uh, unless we're able to locate the people who are in fuel poverty and therefore uh, are able to, 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 to take them out of it. You would um, no, I, d I don't agree with that because uh, this is only part of the picture. As I say, this is a, 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 a national overview. But in terms of looking at proxies, you know, it is looking at proxy measures that are relevant to local authorities as well. Uh, one of the most interesting things about the discussions that I've had uh, over the peace um, convener is that we end up uh, in these meetings talking about um, the bill itself for a very short period of time. Um, and local authorities and other stakeholders are far more interested um, in how uh, we get better. Um, at targeting those folks um, in most need. Um, now, you know, in terms of uh, of all of that, we have seen some great work um, going on across the country uh, through heaps ab schemes, through warm works, um, and through other um, schemes. Uh, what we need to do now um, is to ensure um, that we up the level um, in terms of reaching um, those <coughs> folks. Um, uh, that have uh, that fall into f fuel poverty, who have not yet been covered um, by some of the schemes that we currently have in place. Um, local authorities, as delivery partners, are best placed to do so. Um, they will put those proxies in place. I know um, that many local authorities are looking in depth at all of this, um, and, and you know we will continue to encourage that as we move forward. You wanted to come in some of these points. Thanks, convener. Um, yeah, um, I, I just want to uh, jump back, if I can, to the uh, line of questioning that Mr. Gibson was following, yeah. um, because in the latest uh, house condition survey, uh, there was evidence that um, the, the fuel poverty gap between rural Scotland and urban Scotland has widened uh, in a very short space of time in the, in the past two years, in fact. Um, so I just want to be clear about what, you, what you're committing to here. Um, we mentioned the minimum income standard. Um, you know that we've heard uh, evidence and calls for um, a Scotland-specific sp minimum income standard or a, a, a rural minimum income standard. Are you, are you committing to either of those uh, at, at stage two? I, I think in his evidence... Um Professor Hirsch said that a Scotland-wide uh, minimum income standard would not be that much different um, from uh, uh, UK, from the UK uh, minimum income standard. Um, what I have said and I am committing to in, uh, uh, is to look further um, at remote rural areas, um, taking into account what Mr Gibson has said about the difference between remote rural uh, and remote towns, because I think that's an important distinction to make, um, and looking at the minimum income standard threshold um, in those areas. Um, I uh, will task my officials um, to, to look at this um, in some depth. Um, I am more than happy uh, to share information uh, with the committee um, in that regard. Uh, and then, you know, then we'll look at decisions about what is required in terms of, of moving forward in that front. So that that's possibly could be an amendment to, to the bill? I, I think, uh, Convener, what we have got to do, first of all, is to find out exactly what difference having that would make. Does it make any difference? Um, and uh, obviously, um, if that were to make a difference, uh, then the, the likelihood is that there would be um, uh, amendments brought forward in that re regard, recognising that those differences are there. But I think, first of all, we've got to do that job of work to see exactly um, what difference that makes. Um, but I would reiterate the point in terms of um, there is a dif difference between the remote rural aspect and the Scotland uh, aspect, because I, I think um, from what I have read from Professor Hirsch's evidence, um, um, there is very little difference between the UK MES and having a separate Scottish MES. Yeah, you're, you're, abs you're absolutely right. Now, I've got another line of questioning, convener. I can follow it now if you want to. Yeah. 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 Um, so um, one of the um, uh, key drivers of fuel poverty uh, is, of course, energy efficiency, uh, which we can do something about uh, in Scotland. Um, and so that can be either retrofitting existing houses or building new houses 
uh, to the highest standard possible. The highest standard possible, as far as I know, is uh, passive housing, where you <laughs> require very little heating indeed. In fact, that can it, it eliminate fuel, fuel poverty. Um, do you have any, any plans uh, to introduce uh, passive housing as, uh, as, the stan as the standard for new housing? And what plans do you have uh, in terms of retrofitting to have the, the, the highest standard of retrofitting possible? Um, convener, as the committee will be well aware, um, the government has opened up a, a discussion around about housing beyond 2021. Um, and uh, I and colleagues have been uh, asking people uh, to act as ambassadors to get as many people as possible um, to respond um, to uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, well, get involved in that discussion and then respond to the consultation. Um, there are many uh, things in the agenda uh, that have been brought up already by, by stakeholders, including um, looking um, at standards. And I think that that is the place where we should have the discussion around about how we move on um, in the future in terms of the um, affordable housing programmes and the uh, delivery of social housing. I would say that, um, uh, you know, the social housing that I... Um, regularly visit the new social housing are all um, uh, to a very high standard. Uh, beyond that, we also have the uh, owner-occupied um, sector to look at um, when, it, when it comes to these issues. Um, and I think I've said to the committee previously um, that I will continue to look at building standards um, across um, the, the board. Um, I had hoped that um, we would uh, be uh, much further advanced in terms of some of the building standards work that I want to see uh, being reviewed. But unfortunately, um, as the committee uh, well knows, um, a huge amount of effort uh, in terms of my building standards officials has been on dealing um, with uh, the aftermath of the tragedy at Grenfell to make sure um, that our uh, building standards regulations are absolutely spot on right when it comes to safety. We're, um, I don't want to say we're coming to the end of that work because we're not, um, but there's less uh, there is less going on in that uh, in that piece um, now with the independent panels having reported and now we uh, will move on in terms of legislation and, and other aspects. So there is some free space um, to look at um, uh, 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 building standards as a whole um, and you can be assured that I will be uh, looking and reviewing um, what actually is required as we move forward for all housing types and not just in the affordable and social sector. Um, we, we um, as you know, visited Stornoway, uh -huh. um, and, and, and we heard some, it was probably anecdotal uh, evidence uh, of work, work being carried out on hou houses that was not up, up to scratch, um, and a lack of monitoring of work that's being done. Um, so in other words, you know, go government pays for work, it could be this government or it could be the UK government, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's paying for work to be done on housing, nobody's following up, nobody's checking the work. So you, 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 you are actually getting, there are cowboys out there who are, who are doing substandard work at the public <coughs> expense. I mean, do, do, do you have any plans to... to sort this out? In terms of uh, Mr Simpson's comment that there's no difference between the UK government schemes and the Scottish government schemes, there is a great difference between the UK government schemes um, and the Scottish government schemes. Um, I get uh, crossing my desk um, uh, quite a lot um, of complaints uh, around about uh, some of the work that is going on. Uh, and I would say that a huge amount of those complaints are around about uh, the UK government schemes. Uh, if we look at, for example, uh, the warm works um, situation, um, you know, the, the standard uh, of work is high. 
the customer satisfaction rates are are high. Um, and, you know, where there are difficulties, and I'm not saying um, that it's perfect either, where there are difficulties, um, those uh, are dealt with um, uh, quickly and efficiently, I would uh, say. Uh, I wish uh, it were the same for the UK schemes. Uh, in terms of checking, um, I think it's it's very interesting um, that uh, Mr um, uh, Simpson has raised that. Uh, because one of the um, one of the things which I found during the course of visits uh, uh, across the country during uh, the, the summer um, was that in in some areas um, where it comes to the the heaps area base schemes, um, it was suggested to to me <coughs> by a local authority that some of the people who were in delivery uh, of uh, of that scheme felt that there was too much checking. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think we've got to balance this out. I would say um, that in terms of the schemes that we are delivering, um, we are, 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 are getting it right. Um, I am not convinced by the schemes, the UK government backed schemes, where there have been, um, uh, as Mr uh, Simpson describes them, uh, cowboys, I wouldn't have used that term, there have been folks who um, ha have not uh, been up to the job and who have left people in very, very difficult situations. Um, we have constantly uh, been on to the UK government to try and resolve some of these situations. Um, uh, there uh, have been some steps at various points, but there are still large amounts of people um, in Scotland who have um, uh, houses uh, which uh, have been in some cases, severely damaged um, by the the bad fitting of unsuitable um, uh, 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 energy efficiency measures. Um, what I would say is that if anyone at any point uh, has anything uh, to tell me about the Scottish schemes um, and them not working, I will act um, appropriately and uh, speedily um, to, to resolve those situations. Uh, just, a, just a follow up comment, uh, convener. Thanks very much. Um, um, it, it, it seems to me, I mean, you're right. Um, the, the evidence we heard uh, was really around the U UK schemes. Um, but this work's going on in, in Scotland, as you know. Um, it, if it's not done properly, if it's a botched job, uh, people can still be left with homes that are cold um, and, and, and we've spent you know taxpayers money to get job, jobs done I, I th 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 this committee has to produce uh, a report and, and I cer certainly personally wouldn't be averse uh, to highlighting this uh, as an issue whichever government it is in this case it's UK government so I, th I, I think if you could um, provide us with some evidence um, that, that would be very useful. I, I, I'm, I'm quite happy to do so, and if this uh, committee in its report uh, wants to highlight to the UK government that it needs to do much better um, in terms of the del delivery of the, the schemes that it's responsible for, I would be very happy. Uh, and if it wants to go further in that um, and to tell the UK government uh, that it should resolve the difficulties um, for householders in the likes of the East End of Glasgow and uh, Rother Glen and many other parts of Scotland, I would welcome that um, because um, uh, myself and colleagues um, have uh, communicated with the UK government about this on numerous occasions uh, to try uh, and get uh, them uh, to get the finger out and actually resolve these problems for folks who in some cases um, uh, can I sell their homes because they don't have um, the appropriate building warrants. That is absolutely unacceptable. So I would welcome any help that the committee could give in that regard. Um, in, in terms of some of uh, the UK schemes, um, if you look at Home Energy Scotland, um, it won uh, the Best Customer Focus Award um, this year, which is a huge focus. Um, and the cu customer service satisfaction rates are 97.7%. Um, I actually handed out 
um, uh, certificates to some employees earlier on this year who achieved 100% customer satisfaction levels, which is quite incredible. Uh, obviously, folks who... Um, uh, I'm being corrected because I said UK scheme. I, I should have said Scottish scheme. Home Energy Scotland is a Scottish scheme. Um, and if we look at, um, uh, at Warmworks, it won the award uh, in the GEO Best Service Award for medium and large organisations. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, we, we have award-winning schemes um, here in Scotland rather than uh, some of the... Uh, the schemes that are run by the UK, which uh, wouldn't even get the wooden spoon in my book, convener. OK, thanks very much for that advert for the, the Scottish schemes. The, the, but you will send us that information, because that would be really so useful. I'm more than happy to share that kind of information with the committee, convener. Thank you, Thank you very much, Graeme. Right. Uh, Alexander? Thank you, uh, convener. Good morning, Minister. Can I ask about the consultation requirements and as set out in the bill and how that compares uh, with the previous... Uh, consultation and were any lessons learned uh, from uh, that previous consultation? I, 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 I cannot really talk about the, pre, the consultation in the previous bill, um, convener, because that's uh, uh, well before um, uh, my time. Um, you know, uh, I, um, as well as, as the formal consultations uh, that go on, um, uh, you know, I'm one of these folks who believes in getting out and about and finding exactly what's uh, going on on the ground. Uh, and we will continue uh, to, to liaise with stakeholders um, and uh, uh, who are living in um, or who have lived in fuel poverty in order to develop not just the strategy uh, but also um, deliver delivery. Uh, but in order to get this um, strategy absolutely right, uh, and in order for us to be able to direct support appropriately, um, we, we, we must take cognizance of those folks who are in most need, um, and uh, uh, we'll, we, we will continue to do so. I actually met with um, a group of tenants yesterday um, uh, from uh, the Wheatley Group uh, Housing Associations, their um, uh, welfare uh, reform social security panel, um, to hear firsthand where they um, thought um, difficulties uh, still remained, uh, what we uh, should do um, in terms of uh, moving forward. Um, it has to be said that a, a large amount of yesterday's conversation, though, um, was round about um, the capping of prices of energy companies and uh, the way that energy companies treat people at certain points. Um, and uh, uh, around uh, uh, about incomes, particularly benefit. Um, a large amount of yesterday's um, discussions was around about universal credit. I'll continue to listen to folk um, like those people yesterday who I'm very grateful to for allowing me to speak to them. And you can be assured that as we move forward, we'll continue to do that. We've touched on the, the draft uh, fuel poverty strategy. Uh, it would be interesting to get your comments about the criticism uh, that the government has received uh, with reference to the draft uh, policy, because there seems to be a lack of detail on specific policies and programmes, and it focuses too much on energy efficiency. Uh, that seems to be some of the criticisms that people have, have already put forward with reference to the scheme. And what stakeholders have already said and they want to see is the opportunity to have suggestions for changes to the strategy. Uh, it would be good to hear the Minister's views on that. Um, convener, um, there, there obviously is a, a, an emphasis on e energy efficiency because um, that is one of the, the, the drivers that, that we control. Um, but the draft fuel poverty strategy provides detail on all four drivers um, of fuel poverty uh, and the various support that's available uh, to those that are in, in need um, from our National Fuel Poverty Programme, Warmer Homes uh, Scotland, award-winning, uh, to uh, the funding of Home Energy Scotland, uh, award-winning, uh, to provide that free and impartial energy advice um, to, to callers via their free phone hotline. Um, in addition, uh, HES is the only referral route uh, for households experiencing fuel poverty um, to our national energy efficiency schemes. Um, 
it should be noted that um, what we have, as Mr Stewart has rightly pointed out, is a draft strategy. Um, and uh, uh, our stakeholders, I think, at a national and a local level, um, have a, a critical uh, role to play um, in helping us to develop that um, final um, uh, fuel poverty strategy. Um, there's nothing better than a, a critical friend. Um, so not all of this is not done and dusted. Folk can continue to have their say. Um, and, you know, we will listen to what they have to say and, uh, and uh, develop the fuel poverty strategy um, accordingly. And, and I, I think, you know, you, you identify that it is a draft. Uh, and there are still options and, and room for improvement across the piece. Uh, and that gives local government and local authorities the chance uh, to engage, uh, and they will continue to engage. Uh, but as we've already heard, some, some seem to be much more attuned uh, uh, because of the, the level of fuel poverty that they have within their own uh, local government or local council area. Uh, so so how, how do you think that trying to manage that to ensure that all uh, councils get the same uh, opportunity to suggest, uh, because as I say, there's not all the same expertise uh, ac ac across the piece with, uh, with the authorities. Uh, well, what we have to do is we have to highlight um, best practice to help others along. If, if you look at um, what we have done recently in terms of uh, homelessness, um, as Mr Stewart is well aware, many local authorities have been to see Perth and Kinross of late around <coughs> about their um, rapid uh, rehousing uh, plan. Um, uh, as they formulate their own rapid rehousing plans. We need to look at the best of the best and uh, point to other local authorities in the direction of, of what the exemplars um, are currently doing. Um, also, um, you know, we need to uh, highlight to people uh, some of the schemes that uh, um, are maybe a little bit different uh, that local authorities uh, have undertaken. For example, um, in in Aberdeen City, um, one of the, uh, the the schemes that was beneficial was uh, a scheme to deal with uh, Victorian tenements. Um, you know, I think there's lessons that could be learned uh, from that scheme um, and exported to to other local authorities that have similar housing types. Um, uh, you know, uh, there are also uh, not just in uh, 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 in local authority terms. Um, there are also third sector organisations um, that are doing uh, extremely well in pinpointing those folk that are um, in most needs. We should take the best of the best and export that. Um, I think that uh, in terms of my uh, discussions with, with COSLA, um, they are happy to help us in that regard. Uh, like us, they want to get this absolutely right. So we need to, to, to celebrate the good work that's going on, use the exemplars um, uh, and, and, and spread the message to others um, what can be done. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, Minister. Um, turning to the issue of, of the reporting provisions in the, the bill, um, you will have noted from the evidence uh, received thus far by the committee that uh, there are different views about the um, frequency of such uh, a reporting requirement. Whilst the bill uh, provides for a five-year period, others have suggested that perhaps that would be too infrequent. Um, perhaps the minister could share his views on where we are with that issue now, given the evidence that the committee has received. Um, convener, uh, I've talked uh, about the alignment with various other aspects of policy, um, including the carbon reduction bill, um, the bill that Mr Wheelhouse will bring forward um, at a later point around about district heating um, regimes uh, and other aspects. Um, and I've touched upon Energy Efficient Scotland. Uh, we have proposed a, a five-year uh, reporting cycle to align uh, with the reporting being developed um, for Energy Efficient Scotland. Um, the five-yearly report will take uh, uh, be a stock take uh, of progress over uh, the past five years and a look forward um, to the next five years. Um, and in addition to this, of course, we will continue to, to publish the uh, Scottish Housing Condition Survey, uh, which includes the fuel poverty annual statistics uh, and also our annual programme delivery reports. So we've still got that annual report, if you like, um, in terms of the uh, the, uh, the Scottish Housing Condition Survey and that five-year report. 
Um, I think the, the Minister's answer, certainly um, those who advocated a, a, a more frequent reporting period of perhaps every two or three years uh, felt that this would um, uh, be beneficial uh, in terms of uh, being able to stock take as to where we uh, are on the journey to meet the, the target set forth. Um, has the Minister considered the, the, the weighing of the, the benefits of such more frequent reporting against any particular challenges that he would then see in, 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 in setting forth a more frequent reporting requirement? I think there's a logicality in terms of the uh, alignment with the Energy Efficient Scotland reporting. Um, but, um, uh, you know, um, if uh, if others uh, have uh, have said that we should uh, look at a, a another timescale, I'm more than willing to look at that. I'm pragmatic. I would want to do something logically, um, uh, and that's you know why we suggested the five years to to align with the energy efficient Scotland um, uh, 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 work too. Um, I think for me though. Um, it's always important to uh, avoid um, duplication um, and any unnecessary uh, bureaucracy um, or to create a situation where the, the burden of reporting sometimes becomes greater than the delivery of, uh, of the service that we're trying to deliver, in, in this case, um, uh, energy uh, efficient measure, energy efficiency measures in folks' homes. I'm, I, I, I will look at that, but there is a logicality to what we've proposed. Okay, well, I'm, I'm pleased that the Minister will have a, a look at that. In, in terms of the substance of the reporting, uh, the Minister will be aware that CAS, amongst others, have suggested that the substantive uh, reporting uh, should cover, uh, amongst other things, the four drivers of fuel poverty, uh, and as has been discussed already, in every evidence session, including this morning, convener, um, obviously two of those four drivers are not within the direct control of the Scottish Government as powers currently stand. Um, would the Minister be supportive of the CAS recommendation that notwithstanding that, that the four drivers be uh, included in the substantive provisions of the reporting? Uh, absolutely supportive of uh, CAS's suggestions on that front. Um, as I say, although we uh, don't control um, two of the drivers, I think that it is absolutely um, uh, an imperative for us to, to report uh, on all four. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think in terms of, um, uh, of Kaz's suggestion, I think that's what people out there would expect um, us to do to, to cover all aspects of this, whether this parliament has control um, or no. Okay, well, that's that's an uh, interesting uh, response. Uh, and lastly, convener, if I may, in this uh, suite of issues, um, th there had been a suggestion that there be provision for independent, uh, an independent oversight body uh, in the, the, the bill itself. Uh, and I wonder what the, the minister uh, feels about the efficacy of, of such a, a suggestion. Um, I, I believe that... Um, um, the current provisions are robust enough, and in terms of scrutiny, um, I will expect this. Would expect this committee and the Parliament as a whole uh, to act as the scrutineer in terms of all of this. Um, you know, we've just talked uh, 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 about um, reporting periods, and um, uh, and you know, I say I'm quite pragmatic, and we'll look at some of that. Uh, what I do not want, and I, I said this earlier, is I don't want duplication. I don't want additional bureaucracies uh, where they're unnecessary. Um, and I think, you know, this committee um, has been uh, uh, quite good in terms of, of, of its scrutiny um, uh, over the piece. And I think, the, you know, the scrutiny of all of this should be uh, done by this place, this committee, this parliament. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much. Graham, you wanted to come back in on a couple of um, it's just regarding it, your other it, it, yeah, it's a, a, a slightly different area of questioning, but uh, as, as you know, the DPLR uh, committee um, reports. <laughs> Very sorry, Minister, it gets a bit technical here. Um, so the, their, their report um, highlighted um, one of the powers in the bill that would allow the Scottish Government to change the definition of uh, <coughs> minimum, minimum income standard. Uh, and to appoint, quotes, another person 
as the Scottish Government may from time to time determine. In other words, somebody other than Loughborough University uh, and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. Um, and the committee suggested that that person should be independent from the Scottish Government. What, what's your take on that? Um, I came prepared because I expected uh, some DPLR questions, <laughs> um, uh, as is, is always the, the case. Um, and I, I think Mr um, uh, Simpson is, is talking about the concerns regarding the number of Sco uh, the number of uh, and scope of powers to alter the definition of fuel poverty. That's actually my next question. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're too well prepared. I, I, I am too well prepared, and I, I thank these folks for it. Um, the type of person. Right. Okay. Um, uh, Section 26E2 of the bill. That's how well prepared I am, Mr Simpson. Um, as, as my officials um, have explained to the DPLRC, uh, the intention would be for uh, ministers to use this administrative power if they had to react quickly um, to designate someone other than the academic institution uh, and charitable bodies that are referred to in Section 26 e one, um, that is Loughborough University and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, as uh, Mr Simpson well knows. Um, and, and, and that would only be used if these entities stopped publishing MIS um, or changed their name or otherwise ceased to exist um, in their current form. Um, the difficulty is that, as far as we're aware, um, Loughborough University is the only body uh, which produces the UK MIS. Um, that said, um, I'll have uh, the Scottish Government legal team uh, look into the concerns of the DPLRC um, in uh, further detail. Um, but as Mr um, Simpson is, is well aware, um, you know, as it stands, Loughborough and Joseph Rowntree Foundation um, are the biz when it comes to MIS. <laughs> Oh dear. Oh, no. I didn't even mean that, convener. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, this, that reminds me of that session we were talking about earlier on. Pre-prepare that. Uh, I, I did not, I did not. I'm ashamed of myself now. <laughs> Graham, I think you've got another question to ask them. Uh, well, I'd, I'd, I'd ask it Move with on. some trepidation. The, the one in trepidation that I was going to answer first, yeah. Yes. Um, so, you... You know, there's some wide, wide scope of powers in the bill. One is uh, uh, to alter the definition of fuel poverty. Now, obviously, um, any, any you know, if a government was to do that, uh, not just this government, but you, you could alter the definition in order to uh, take people out of fuel poverty. So that, that, that's a possibility. If you had a cynical government, that they, they could do that. Um, so there were concerns um, uh, around this from from the DPLR committee, um, and I just wonder if you, you know, you could respond to those concerns. Um, I, I will, convener. Um, uh, both uh, kinds of regulations would be subject to the affirmative parliamentary procedure. Um, moreover, under Section 11 um, of the of the bill, uh, ministers would require to consult with those they considered appropriate, uh, which would have to include those living or who have lived um, in fuel poverty. Uh, thus, any regulations uh, which would alter the definition of fuel poverty uh, proposed by the bill uh, would come under uh, a very, very high degree um, of scrutiny indeed. Um, I welcome the um, DPLR's uh, lines of questioning in all of this because um, I do think that that level of scrutiny is required. I hope uh, that that response gives uh, Mr Simpson the, the comfort that he was looking for. Thank you. I am just uh, uh, appreciate the Minister not throwing in a joke on that one. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think that was a unanimous decision. Uh, the, the, can I thank uh, Liam McArthur and Jackie Bailey for their patience uh, in sitting through this committee? Do you have any questions you'd like to ask the Minister?
Yes, please. On you, um, Roger. Convener, and I, I recognise it is indeed panto season, um, given the, the Minister's jokes earlier. Could I, could I declare an interest, though, as the Honorary Vice President of Energy Action Scotland, and I would refer members to my register of interest. Um, could I stick with definitions for a moment, Minister? Um, because I'm interested to understand the thinking behind some of the changes you've made. Now, um, people tell me that those who suffer most from fuel poverty are in fact pensioners and those living in rural areas. Um, and I'm sure Liam MacArthur will come on to explore one aspect of that with you. Um, but sticking with pensioners, you've moved the definition from 60, as it currently is, to 75. Now, I'm sure you'd accept there are many people in Scotland um, who don't reach the age of 75, but are in quite acute fuel poverty. Can I ask why you've removed them from the definition? Um, uh, convener, uh, there are many um, people who suffer from fuel poverty, um, and Ms Bailey um, has highlighted uh, those who live in rural, rural areas, uh, uh, remote rural areas, uh, and uh, older folks, but we have seen um, in some recent reports, including um, a, a report from Citizens Advice Scotland, um, if I remember rightly, um, that many folks who are now caught um, in the fuel poverty trap um, are actually um, younger people. Um, so I think that we have got to take cognizance um, of all uh, parts of society, all demographics, uh, those folks who live in urban uh, and uh, rural areas. Um, so it's not just uh, about one um, set uh, of demographics or one group of people. But, but um, what I would say to uh, Ms Bailey in terms uh, of uh, the situation around about older folks is that house, house it holds, households eligible um, for enhanced heating um, is to be defined in regulations. Uh, we said that we would consult um, in all of that. If we look at uh, some of the key uh, scenarios uh, around uh, about older, older people, uh, many more older people now are living uh, healthy, active and independent lives uh, well into their retirement. Uh, the independent panel uh, that reviewed the definition of fuel poverty recommended uh, that if an age thre threshold were to be used to identify one of the categories of households which would be eligible for an enhanced heating regime, that threshold should be in the region of 75 to 80. Uh, in the draft strategy, um, we are proposing to adopt the lowest age uh, suggested by the panel. Uh, so that a household which is a member aged 75 or over uh, would be covered by the enhanced heating regime. However, our draft strategy does not suggest um, that uh, over 75 uh, is the only criteria. Uh, and it also states uh, that households with at least uh, one member self-reporting as having a physical or mental health condition or illness lasting or expected to last 12 months uh, or are more likely uh, uh, to be covered uh, should be in that regime. Sorry I caused a scramble amongst your, your uh, civil servants looking there we for go. sticky notes they to want, hand they want, you. They want to it, make sure it, that I get it absolutely indeed, right. Indeed, indeed. But, but it really is very simple in the sense that, I mean, you would acknowledge in some parts of Scotland people don't <coughs> reach the age of 75. And by making this change in definition, you actually cause a 3% drop. Now that's quite a substantial number of people who will no longer be regarded. And I just wonder whether you couldn't review that, because I think it's not about competing interests. It is about making sure that we catch everybody who is in fuel poverty. And on the point of younger people, um, your definition starts at age five and over. Um, surely the point at which a child potentially is most vulnerable is from zero to five. And again, I wonder whether you would, would review that to make sure it's all encompassing. As I said um, at the very beginning of this, um, we will consult on uh, these issues. So I'm sure that folk will uh, put in uh, their uh, views at that particular point in time. Um, what I would say is, um, convener, is that we look very carefully at what the independent panel uh, suggested uh, when we came forward with, uh, with, with these aspects of the bill. 
I have one final question, convener. It's a very small one. Um, it, the, there have been some accusations that this is a bit like business as usual. Um, and indeed, it relates to finance, which of course is important for the bill. Um, you know, I think Energy Action Scotland said back in 2006 they needed something like, or well, the government needed 200 million a year if they were to hit their target. Um, clearly, now you're at 100 million, just over 100 million a year in the budget. 30 million of which is financial transactions, so that's repayable. Um, is that enough? And have you done modelling? For your target of 2040, which may or may not be the one that, that ends up at the end, have you done modelling as to whether that's sufficient to deliver on your um, vision? Um, in terms of the uh, modelling that has been uh, done over the course of this, I might write to the committee um, in okay. some more depth um, uh, rather than have Ms Clarkson go through uh, right all of the work <laughs> that uh, her and her colleagues uh, ha have, have been done. Um, as the committee um, is well aware, uh, the government committed to uh, half a billion pounds worth of funding uh, on the uh, run up to uh, in the years in the run up to 2021. We will meet that. Um, as uh, uh, Ms Bailey and other members know, um, uh, Mr Mackay is uh, uh, in the case of uh, budget discussions is willing to talk to to every party around about this, but as he quite clearly stated, um, if there is to be uh, spend uh, more spend in one area, um, there would have to be uh, an identification of where that money um, was uh, uh, coming from. Uh, in terms of the spend that we currently have, um, you can be assured uh, that uh, I do everything possible um, to make sure we get uh, the best value that we possibly can, uh, to uh, get the uh, most uh, uh, interventions um, that, that, that we possibly can in people's homes to get them out of uh, fuel poverty. Um, so um, we'll send the modelling stuff, uh, and I'm sure that Mr Mackay is open to discussions uh, with colleagues uh, on the run-up to the budget, if that is what they want to do. Thank you, convener. Th thank you, Jack. <laughs> William. Convener, I, I'm not sure how much more progress we'll make, because I know the, the minister, you've already stated that you're um, prepared to keep under review issues around definition, and in particular concerns have been raised about um, the, the failure for the bill to include a remote rural MIS. But in that context, perhaps um, I, I might reinforce that, that argument. Obviously, this is a recommendation from the uh, Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force, um, recommendation from the Independent uh, Expert Panel. Um, it is a view shared by, I think, every organisation across the Highlands and Islands that has any involvement uh, in uh, seeking to address fuel poverty in that region and, I think, uh, in other parts of rural Scotland uh, as well. It is, from what I have heard and, and what I've read of the evidence received by the committee, the overwhelming view uh, of uh, the witnesses that have, have, have given evidence um, that the bill needs to include a remote uh, rural MIS. I think the concerns that uh, you raised previously, Minister, about um, the potential increase in cost and delay that would result from inclusion of remote uh, rural MIS uh, have been laid to uh, rest by um, uh, by that evidence. Uh, the concern you've raised today on top of that about the potential exclusion of places like Kirkwall, Stornoway, Lerwick uh, and, and whatnot, as I understand it, have been again addressed by Professor Hirsch, who uh, told this committee that there is no reason why um, this should not include Category 4 remote rural towns as well as Category 6 remote rural settlements, as I think in his view the difference between disposable income in Category 4 areas um, is very uh, is marginal in, in, in relation to the uh, rural communities surrounding uh, those towns. So I think on that basis, building up a picture that um, this bill, in order to achieve its objectives, in order to ensure it doesn't artificially um, depress levels of, rural fuel, of fuel poverty in rural and island areas, has to include a remote rural Ms. I don't expect you to accede to that now, but what I would, I think, um, with, with all due respect, ask you to do again ahead of stage two is, is, is reconsider the position on that um, and, and, and ideally come forward with an amendment at stage two. Um, convener, um, uh, as uh, Mr MacArthur uh, knows very well, um, I've had discussions uh, 
with a huge number of folk uh, around about a lot of issues which affect uh, remote rural and island communities, including uh, say, Mr MacArthur himself. And uh, uh, on a number of occasions, and my door um, is always uh, open. Um, we take uh, a view um, at the beginning that it would be too costly um, to develop a, a, a regional uh, a, 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 a MIS uh, situation, and it would take several years uh, to do so. Um, and quite frankly, in, in terms of spend, I would, uh, as I think many others, would rather spend money on interventions um, where that is um, uh, at all possible. But, but um, Minister, I mean, that, that, that was put directly, certainly, to the first panel um, sure, in this committee, sure. and, and, and they refuted that. I mean, actually, the, 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 the cost element... Um, would be marginal, and, sure. and, and the government is already committed to making changes to their own definition, sure. and that in themselves will in incur uh, a cost. Uh, as I said in my opening uh, remarks, Convener, the Ar Argyll and Butte option deals um, with some of our cost concerns, but also uh, looks at uh, as other aspects of all of this, and that's why uh, we will look at this. Mm -hmm. um, I am more than willing uh, to continue to talk to members about uh, all of the issues um, that arise during the course of, of um, the, 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 the scrutiny um, of this bill. Uh, Mr MacArthur knows that my door is open. We will do this uh, work, as I have said, uh, and we will uh, come back um, uh, and let the committee know exactly what the outcome of that work is. And just finally, in terms of the island impact assessment that you've committed to carrying out, I, I, I certainly welcome that. Um, I think it would need to be as detailed as possible. It can't be a desk-based exercise and will need to involve the engagement of local authorities, housing associations and, and, and as I say, a range of stakeholders who have um, offered their views on, on this issue. As I said earlier on, um, the, that part of the bill is not enacted yet. But in the spirit of the uh, 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 the Act, sorry, I keep saying Bill, that part of the Islands Act is not enacted yet. But in the spirit of, of all of this, we agreed that we would do an Islands Impact Assessment. Um, Mr MacArthur uh, knows uh, uh, that I uh, listen uh, to the folks of Orkney, Shetland, the Western Isles and the other islands. Um, including Aaron and the Cumbries, I thought I'd better get that in there. Mr Gibson won't forgive me uh, in all that I do. Uh, and we will ensure that uh, the assessment is the right assessment. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, can I just thank everybody for their attendance today? I'll now spend briefly to allow a witness change over for the next, for the next agenda item. Thank you.
The next item on our agenda is a consideration of an affirmative statutory instrument. The instrument amends the tolerable standard in section 86 of the Housing Scotland Act 1987, adding requirements to have satisfactory equipment installed for detecting fire and carbon monoxide across all housing. The committee will take evidence on the instrument today, and I welcome again Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, who is joined by Luke McCauley, Head of Housing Standards and Quality, and Kirsten Simone Lefebvre, Solicitor, Scottish Government. This instrument is laid under the affirmative procedure, which means that Parliament must approve the instrument before the provisions can come into force. Following this evidence session, the committee will be invited at the next agenda item to consider a motion to approve the instrument. And I invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. Uh, convener, I'm grateful for the opportunity today uh, to speak to this motion to approve the Housing Scotland Act 1987, Tolerable Standard, Extension of Criteria, Order. Uh, requiring all homes to have smoke and heat alarms uh, as well as carbon monoxide detectors and strengthening and enhancing fire safety for all Scottish homes. The Scottish Government is committed to achieving improved fire safety and as I'm sure the committee will agree, one death from a fire in Scotland is one too many. Uh, back in June 2017, uh, following the tra tragic events of, at Grenfell Tower, um, the government took uh, immediate steps to establish a ministerial working group on building and fire safety. Uh, the group was established to offer public reassurance and ensure all lessons from Grenfell were applied here in Scotland and to help ensure that people are safe in Scotland's buildings. As part of this work, uh, the group agreed that consultation on fire and smoke alarms, uh, originally proposed through the Common Housing Quality Standard Forum and planned for winter 2017-18, should be prioritised. The consultation sought views on potential changes to standards required for fire and smoke alarms in domestic properties in Scotland. As it currently stands, uh, there are different standards for fire and smoke alarms depending on the tenure of the home and when it was built. In consultation responses, there was very strong support for a common new minimum standard across all housing, regardless of tenure. There was also strong support for that new standard to be based on the standard currently applying to private rented sector property. Uh, taking account of these views and as set out in the guidance accompanying the order, it is proposed that the existing high standard required in the private rented sector and of new build properties is extended to all homes. Alarms may be hardwired or long life battery powered and should also be interlinked. If an alarm sounds in the kitchen, it might not be heard elsewhere in the house, so interlinking improves the chances of detection. Carbon monoxide alarms will also be required. Scotland already has rigorous standards for smoke and fire alarms, but we want and expect everyone to benefit from the same level of protection. The standard will come into force in February 2021. However, we hope that most people rec uh, recognising the safety benefits will take action uh, much sooner. Over the last 20 years, the number of fires has nearly halved, and the number of fire fatalities has fallen by over 60%. Significant progress has been made in fire safety as we look to realise our vision for safer and stronger communities across Scotland. However, uh, we must not be complacent. We know that the presence of uh, working fire and smoke alarms significantly reduces casualties and fatalities within the home, and that is why I ask you to support this motion today to improve fire safety in all Scottish homes. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Graham, I believe you've got a number of questions. Yeah. Um, can I first of all um, thank thank the Minister uh, for responding to um, some uh, a number of written questions that I had ahead of this uh, session. I think it's uh, been very useful uh, indeed, and probably will save us time uh, in, uh, today. Um, one of my questions, uh, as you'll recall, was uh, around what what do what happens if people can't afford to, to get these alarms fitted. Um, 
you um, estimated in your reply to me that it could, could cost £200 to uh, get sort of hardwired alarms put in. I would suspect it might be a bit more than that because, you know, you, if you're fitting new, new wiring into a house, you're then going to have to redecorate, etc. However, irrespective of the cost, um, you, you produced um, a very interesting and useful table um, actually, um, uh, around uh, what councils are doing, and you said that uh, councils have powers to provide advice and assistance. Um, uh, it's called the scheme of assistance, actually. Um, uh, and we've got a very uh, pa patchy scene out there. Uh, it, it was quite illuminating. Um, 21 of Scotland's 32 councils um, haven't, haven't given out any money in, in the past year <coughs> under this. Uh, in fact, Glasgow accounts for 86% of the money. So my first question would, would be, are you, uh, are you planning to um, uh, address this sort of patchy situation? Um, convener, I'm very grateful uh, to Mr. Simpson uh, for his engagement with myself and with officials. Um, and for the questions that he has asked. And uh, I understand that all committee members uh, have those answers. Um, and, uh, you know, as Mr Simpson says, that helps iron out um, a, a number of things. In terms of um, scheme of assistance um, stats that Mr uh, Simpson has highlighted, um, it is up to local authorities themselves in terms of uh, what they want to do uh, in terms of schemes of assistance um, and what they uh, want to spend uh, in terms uh, of uh, those uh, schemes of assistance. Um, it is not for me to direct local authorities um, in that regard uh, and how they should utilise um, their resource. Um, but, um, you know, my own experience as a, 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 a councillor um, is that um, these schemes can be beneficial not only for uh, the householder who's directly getting the resource, uh, but also um, for others. Um, and again, um, as I said uh, in response to Mr Stewart earlier, uh, I think, you know, there is best practice that could be uh, looked at and exported um, uh, and other authorities uh, could benefit from some of the work that has gone on in certain places in that regard. Yeah, it, look, it looked to me like probably Glasgow um, heavily promoting the scheme um, and others others just, just aren't. Um, so maybe we've got best practice in Glasgow but not, not elsewhere. Um, the alarms... Them, themselves, uh, I, I understand that, that the fire service um, can um, give out alarms to uh, to people who, who maybe can't afford them at the moment. Uh, but the alarms that they're giving out currently would not be compatible uh, with your new standards. Is that something you you would be hoping to address? Um, convener, we have had, uh, as you would expect. Uh, a huge amount of conversation uh, with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service uh, around uh, about uh, these changes. Um, considerations are ongoing uh, with SFRS regarding uh, potential funding to enable the new standard, standard of alarms uh, to be fitted through their home fire safety visits, um, which are carried out at high risk and vulnerable uh, homes. Um, uh, as uh, we, we will continue those discussions um, with the Scottish Fire and Re Rescue Service as we move forward uh, in order to get this right. I'm going to look to Mr McCauley to see if there's any further update from the SFRS on this issue, because uh, I know that all of this has been pretty fluid. Yeah, not really a further update, other than those considerations are ongoing. As, as Mr Stewart said, we've, we've talked with the fire service and continue to do so right from the start of this consultation, and we'll have very close engagement with them. And as the Minister said, those, those scoping discussions around the potential for funding uh, at home fire safety visits um, for the more high-risk and vulnerable visits is something that's been very actively considered. OK. Um, so when we're talking about the tolerable standard, if, uh, if, if a council goes into somebody's house and it, uh, that, that home fails the tolerable standard, ultimately, I mean, the most severe penalty, if you like, is they could 
tell somebody they need to move out. Now, you use um, the word proportionate in your response to my written questions. So clearly, uh, in, in my view, it would not be proportionate to tell someone they need to leave their home just because they don't have these alarms fitted. And you're nodding your head, so I, th I think you probably uh, agree with that. I'm just wondering if we can set out something in guidance that makes that clear. Uh, th there's always a difficulty in the use of language um, um, in guidance and, uh, you know, definitions of, of various words um, have, have been asked for at various points. The word reasonable uh, comes to mind uh, uh, is one of those ones that are questioned. What I, I can uh, assure um, uh, Mr uh, Simpson and all members um, is that I will go through the guidance with a fine tooth comb to make sure um, that we ha what we have is um, proportionate. I agree uh, completely and utterly uh, with Mr Simpson that it would not be uh, proportionate to um, put someone out of their house because they don't have the alarms or uh, to demolish their house uh, uh, because they don't have the alar alarms. So um, the committee can be assured that I will go through that with a fine tooth comb in order that we get that absolutely uh, spot on right. Okay. Thanks, Marina. Okay, thank you very much, Graham. Uh, oh, Andy, my apologies. Yes, thank you. Uh, Minister, what, in general terms, what's, what uh, publicity is undertaken when regulations change um, like this in a way that affects every home occupier in Scotland? Um, there, there will be a lot of uh, awareness raising um, around about these changes. Again, uh, we will do that in... Uh, in combination with partners, including SFRS. Um, we have also uh, looked at um, ensuring that we have publicity um, so that people are not uh, conned into buying something that is uh, uh, not the right fit for all of this. Um, so again, uh, you can be assured that we will be working uh, on uh, a strategy to ensure that we get those messages across to people. Uh, the last thing that I would want um, is for anybody uh, to be hoodwinked into getting uh, systems that are not compatible um, with this new legislation. And we will work in partnership uh, with others to make sure that we get all of this right. I just wanted to follow up with that very point because um, I can't think of the last time when legislation purported to require, it doesn't actually require, but it appears to require yeah. because the idea that your house might be below tolerable standards is something yeah. that people will not want to be the case. So it, it, it appears to require, um, and we'll be talking about a lot of you know vulnerable people. Absolutely. Um, so the question of ensuring that there is some guidance on exactly what's required and what's not required and support available through the usual consumer support groups, I think it's been incredibly important. Um, we have had discussions with numerous um, folk, but uh, I can assure Mr. Whiteman uh, that we will talk to the likes of Citizens Advice Bureau, other consumer groups um, to get that message across. It is imperative that we get this right. I don't want to be any, to see anybody fleeced, uh, and we will get this right in terms of publicity. So to be clear, this could involve things like newspaper adverts that um, say, you know, I, deadline approaching, or, or is that maybe a little I, bit too alarmist? I, but I, I, I think um, we would have to work that through. Um, I'm not going to sit here, convener, and say um, that newspaper adverts are the way forward to do this because um, they may not be. Uh, I think one of the key things in all of this um, is the message from the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service um, as well as ourselves. Uh, Ms Ewing is, is nodding there as I'm saying that. They have been uh, immensely uh, uh, good in terms of all aspects of the work that has stemmed from the ministerial working group. They are a trusted body um, and, you know, if there's a message to be gotten out there, uh, I think that they, they could be a, really helpful uh, in this regard. They, of course, are not the, the only ones uh, and we will we will look to make sure that we get this absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Annabelle, you well, want yes, to uh, the Minister anticipated me, but just really to make the point, having sat on the Ministerial Working Group and understanding the genesis of these regulations, which really are very, very important, Absolutely. in my view, in terms of seeking to protect people from fire in the home, 
that the SFRS really, you know, they're well trusted uh, as a public uh, uh, service and um, quite rightly so. They have earned that respect from the public and they're really very well placed indeed to assist with the rollout of Absolutely. this in a reasonable, proportionate manner that does not alarm people but um, encourages uh, uh, people to consider their safety at, at home. So I just wanted to make that point on the record. Thank you very much. Uh, in that case, then, we will move on to the next ag agenda item, which is for the committee to formally consider motion S5M-15050, calling for the Local Government and Communities Committee to recommend approval of the Draft Housing Scotland Act 1987 Tolerable Standard Extension of Criteria, Order 2019. Minister, do you wish to...? Uh, I'll just move, can we uh, do any members wish to speak on this part? Graham? Yeah. <coughs> um, so, um, having, having had the uh, Minister's uh, uh, assurances there, um, I'm certainly my, minded to support this. Um, uh, as Ms Ewing uh, uh, has alluded to, it stemmed from an important piece of work which followed the Grenfell tragedy. So we have to remember where this has come from. Um, and it is all about um, safety in the, in the home. Um, but clearly we're extending things to every home and we're extending things to the owner-occupied sector. Um, as Mr Stewart said earlier, the private rented sector is already, is already covered, um, but the owner-occupied sector isn't. So that's a, that's a very difficult nut to crack. Um, and I wanted to see a, a, a system which was more carrot than stick, and I think that's uh, what the Minister is, is, is trying to get to. So, given his assurances around guidance, uh, given what he said about getting the fire service uh, involved, and they're a very important body in this, um, I think that you know having the fire service point you in the right direction onto what 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 to get in your home would be a useful thing. Um, given all that, um, I'd certainly be supportive of it. Thank you very much. Do any other members wish to make a contribution? No. In that case, Minister, do you wish to sum up? Um, I'll, I'll, just, uh, I'll just briefly um, sum up, um, because I, I think David McGowan um, of the, the, the fire service um, has, uh, has said a number of things around about this. The, the presence of working smoke and heat detectors have been proven to significantly reduce casualties and fatalities occurring as a result of fires within the home. SFRS therefore welcome uh, and support the next steps from this consultation, which will undoubtedly improve home safety for all residents, regardless of tenure. Um, Mr McGowan has uh, been a member of the Ministerial um, Working Group, um, uh, as, as was um, Ms Ewing. Um, I, I'm very grateful to the fire service for their collaboration um, in all of the work that we're doing. There have also been positive responses um, from tenants and uh, from other uh, tenant stakeholder organisations uh, around about this move. Um, can I finish um, uh, on a, a happy note, uh, since this will be the last time I appear in front of the committee this year? At least I hope that's the case. Um, I would like to thank members for their cooperation um, around about this. I'm always more than happy to, to provide um, uh, the answers that people need um, uh, uh, around about some of the bits that they think may be a little bit sticky. Um, the fact that members, um, particularly Mr Simpson, went out of their way to ask questions, I think means that the entire committee uh, has benefited from uh, from th those answers, and I think that maybe made your job uh, a little bit easier today. Um, so thank you, and have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you all. I no doubt see you early on in the New Year. Yeah, I have no doubts at all. The, the, therefore, the, the question is that motion S5M15050, in the name of the Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The committee will report on the outcome of this instrument shortly. Uh, do members agree to delegate authority to me as convener to approve the final draft of the report? Yes. Thank you. In that case, we thank the Minister for his attendance. Thank you. And I wish you uh, and your officials a you. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I look forward to seeing you probably early in January.
I'll move the session into private.